good friends of the show at Sayana. I, I think we've got to be careful not to go off the rails because I'm, I'm not a fan of what we've seen here. So there have been some board changes. The managing director has left. That's Brett Lynch. Effective immediately. Effective immediately. We personal spoke reasons. about him personal reasons, yeah. for personal reasons, which we, you know, you have to respect. Down, there are down 25% today, Joe. It's nice 30, and mate. I think that reaction that the market is showing toward this stock is the exact reaction that we have. I, I don't like this. A company's managing director resigning during ramp up is enough of a red flag. Doing it a few weeks after being paid $1.9 million retroactively is not a good look and it's horrible. I mean, I'm not too sure there's much more I can say on that one. Right, boys, Fortescue. The good <laughs> news rolls on. Another, <laughs> another, and we're talking like the 10th, are we? Leadership change. Yep, 10th in the in the past roughly three years. The CEO, Fiona Hick, has uh, mutually agreed to leave after six months. On to clear. They, um, they had a summary or a headline that summarised this one best. Fortescue's revolving door is a joke. Righto, buddy Viders. Welcome to Hay Street. <laughs> Boys, what a bloody achievement. Four months in and we're, uh, we have got bloody high roll and office space. What a momentous occasion, Matty. I, um, yeah, I think this is a, a moment worth celebrating. Unfortunately, we don't have a beer in here to celebrate yet, but oh, that's mate, on the to-do list. Beer for, can I bring... Can I don't I get think we need any encouragement on that part. <laughs> What about a kegerator with Swan Draft on tap or who, whichever beer brewer, bloody beverage person sponsors us? Swanny D should be so lucky, mate. Oh, how <laughs> bloody good is it? Well, boys, and you know, you know the best thing, Trav, and we're going to get into it today, being in West Perth gave us the opportunity to just walk down to the road to the CWA play. There was no scones, jam and cream there for the Five Inch vote. <laughs> yeah, we went to the Five Inch general meeting, which was called upon by – disgruntled shareholders <laughs> in a bid to um bid to oust the board there. It was actually a very educational experience. I'm sure you and I will um go into that uh, Matty, your, in a moment. Your first shareholder meeting you've been to, right? Uh yes. Been to been to like a AGM before, but not yeah. like an actual this 249D. This ain't your usual bloody cup of tea. Exactly. A pretty exciting one. What else have we got today? Right, boys. A uh, few cap raises, eh? Yeah, a couple of cap raises going on. But uh -oh. some a lot of a couple of le significant leadership changes in the industry. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to dig in on that front. Obviously, we're talking about Fortescue, there's the big one, and also some movement at Sayona, which is definitely going to get a mention. Friends of the show. Yeah. Bowen Coking Coal had an interesting Bowen. update. Bowen. <laughs> Bowen <laughs> Mangoes. Have you heard of the Bowen Mango JD? You need to get over a small mate. <laughs> Black I'm mangoes. learning from you every day, mate. Everything about Queensland. Yeah. Romelius also had some news at WA1 and, like you said, a couple capital raises, which we'll, we'll touch on in a, in a broader way. Sensational. Right, our first bloody episode of the uh, West Perth era for Money of Mine is brought to you by our great friends at Top Trill. Mate, I can see a small part of JD die inside every time you mention West Perth. Let's just let's just call it <laughs> the <laughs> Money of Mine you, podcast say, studio. A bit of him dies every time we mention a sponsor. We're, we're, what's, this building's got a name, doesn't it? Like, let's just call 1202 it. One two o two High Street. We'll call it. And the, it's got a proper name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I reckon JD would want to not associate himself with West Perth. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you, really, you really created such a character around me. I'm not sure. Yeah, you're, like, you're, the, you're the youngest, but you're the oldest man. How I feel about it. You're like the grandpa in Money of Mine. Mm. Uh, Harry. Harry to be bloody frothing that we're mentioning the street address, so we're not giving away free <laughs> rental sponsorship. Thanks to Top Drill for supporting Money of Mine. As always, Toppy and Ange looking straight at you. Cheers. Drilling into the future. Boys, let's get into it. Yeah, I'm, I, well, I'm keen to hear from you guys. First of all, let's get into Five Inch at the top of the show. So you guys wandered down. They had the, um, the meeting at 10 a.m. this morning. Now, for those that didn't catch our Five Inch Bonanza show, mm. we went into the full history of what has gone on there from when the company was first called Marley Lithium, then they had the spin out, the Gulamina asset came out with Leo Lithium and we really fleshed that in. It was a, it was a great show. Paddy, the, uh, the intern, went into some real depth there. It was fascinating to hear what's gone on. So the company's obviously been in suspension for getting on 14 months now. What was the mood like in the room there? Well, it was, it was interesting walking in because we're like, are we actually going to get allowed in? Because we're the, the person at the front with the computer and we're like, we're, we're not shareholders. They're like, I'll oh, just take a visitor's pass. Yeah. And all, all full credit to Trav. He's bloody 
he puts the balls on the line these days and he's straight in there. So I probably would have been like, this looks too hard. <laughs> but we walked in as it was um, as it was underway. I think they were on the second resolution. Yeah, they were. We probably missed the juiciest bit, but I felt like it was still it very was still bloody drama heavy. juicy, yeah. yeah. So you, the, would, you would have felt the tension in the room, right? Oh, mate, mm. it was hot. And, like, that's not just because I think they didn't have air con on. That was because you could really absolutely feel the emotion. It was yeah. intense. You could... You know, I, I don't want to make assumptions, but you could feel the disdain that the shareholders had for the board. And equally, I felt you could also feel the disdain some of the board had for the shareholders in front of them. It was a real tense moment. And the, a lot of that disdain was coming from one shareholder specifically. <laughs> he was pretty he was pretty active. Um, but I dare say he's he's representative of the, uh, the wider picture there. There's obviously a lot of shareholders that couldn't make it today. Yeah. And that one shareholder is obviously voicing his concern, the one you told me about. Mm. But I think it's would you know I think it'd be right to say that's fairly representative of how a lot of the sort of you know a lot of the tension that exists between the two parties, right? And I guess for people that don't know what was going on, this was the the two four nine D vote to remove. The company's non-exec directors, Brett Fraser, Bradley Gorgon, Gordon and Mark Hepburn, and to appoint two new directors, Gary Lower and Gareth John Edwards. And there was another, it said, subsequently one of the convening shareholders nominated Mr. Zoran Mehmed, mm -hmm. who is a, um, a significant shareholder himself. So, look, the, the result was the incumbent board won, essentially, 62 to 38. So the 249D failed, mm -hmm. uh, which was, as was mentioned in the episode, was brought about by the Hot Copper Folk on a GoFundMe page. A bit unorthodox of how you'd see a 249D established. And they Tr also had the opportunity to talk. Right. The, the oh, that they did, and geez, didn't that make it bloody interesting? Oh, that mm. was great, Trav. There was the Q &A some. Um, was wicked. Oh, and there was some. Uh, you'd say there was a bit of abuse getting hurled at the incumbent board. Um, Trav, highlights for you, mate. I had a, a couple few, of things stood out to you. Yeah, a few takeaways. And I think in our previous coverage, we highlighted the mammoth task that the requisitioning shareholders were up against when it when you try and um, have a successful 249D, these things are really, really hard to accomplish and very rarely um, have the result that requisitioning shareholders want. And that's largely because you need to convince the proxy advisors to vote your way. The default position of a proxy advisor is to defend the incumbent board unless you have a very, very sophisticated campaign that articulates why this new board is going to be far better, far more experienced and um, have a better strategy. And in this case, all of the three proposed new directors um, talked very briefly. The very first statement all three even made was, I don't have any ASX experience, but... And um, what came after the but was very, very valid. But I think the fact that they all started with, I don't have ASX experience, kind of hones in on what would have been one of the, um, the, the, the highlighted points made by the proxy whisperers to convince the proxy advisors not to support the requisitioning shareholders in this vote. Um, one... One quote that really sort of stood out to me, Maddie, was from that third board member, Zoran Mehmed, who you mentioned. Yeah, prepar, yeah the third proposed board member by the requisition. Mm. So he, he said, um, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here because I can't remember his exact words, but he said something along the lines of, I purely want what's best for shareholders. I want to make sure the cash that is left in this vehicle is distributed and the LLL shares that Five Inch has are also distributed as soon as possible. He also said that if you add up all of the shares owned by the incumbent board, that his Zoran's personal shareholding is many multiples of that. Um, you know, he, he disclosed that he, he owned about nine million shares himself, um, and it was it was a kind of astonishing figure, right? Yeah, one point one billion shares on issues. Yeah. So I think if he has ten million, so yeah. Yeah. no, 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 one percent of the company, not yeah. ten. Correct, one percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it, it sort of, I think for me, really honed in on that point of alignment. And, you know, this is something we talk about a lot and we'll continue to talk about a lot is the fact that um, the vibe in that room was that shareholders were disgruntled because they felt like the incumbent board might be more persuaded by um, maybe a salary or, may, or or whatnot. They quoted the number $2 million um, is coming out of this company every single quarter. And if you think about the dynamics of a, of a board member, what sometimes might be important, I'm speaking generally here, not specific to Five Inch, sometimes might be more important, is the NPV of your wage as a director 
as opposed to the actual capital gain of your shares because you don't own enough shares. And so I think what you saw here was the shareholders were trying to put forward three people who own material amounts of five inch shares. And that was a way to, to sort of maximize alignment with the other shareholders. Mm, and it was the question was raised from the audience or the, the requisitioning shareholders to uh, one of the pre Mr. Lower, I think, um, asking, oh, look, do you do you intend to what would it asking a question about the Leo Lithium shares out of escrow? Do you intend to distribute them as soon as they come out of escrow? He's like, No, I can't comment on that. Sorry. But uh, Mr. Mehmed, Zora Mehmed, he went straight into it and then even uh, highlighted the amount of 249Ds that the incumbent board had been to, like pointed them one by one. How many? You've been through four. You've been through. This is your second, isn't it? This is your first. It was yeah. – um, it was. It, was it an, started it, to get a bit heated at the end there. It was yeah, uh, very and, interesting to watch. And from Zoran, it was an admission of I wish I did my homework on these board members before I bought all of these shares. I think, he's, I think he actually said that. Yeah, which, <laughs> you know, he, he was speaking to the fact that the board members, he felt like, had a history of – creating an environment where shareholders become disgruntled. This is the ultimate feat of that at Section 249D. So when you talk about the proxy, proxy whisperers, Trav, because you think if, if this 249D can't get up after everything that Firefinch has gone through, he's like, right, what 249D could get up? But you're saying a big function of that, of that is the fact that the requisitioning shareholders, which were from Hot Copper and everyone, which you need 5% or more, because they didn't have a proxy whisperer on their side, they didn't have that extra yes. force to get it over the line. Do you think that was a big driving factor? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. Bloody good in that. Jeez, you, you should start a bloody mining podcast, Trav. <laughs> You're a bloody great, great yeah. analysis. It was, it was an awesome educational experience to go to that. Um, mm. And yeah, I mean, I mean, hopefully in the future we can see um, shareholders kind of align themselves in, in a way that they have, like sort of, you know, like they have coordinated themselves sort of you know, independently of a of a, a real sophisticated party. Hopefully they can do that in the future in a way that actually is effective mm. um, and that will probably require hiring proxy whisperers. Yeah. I, I, I was surprised they let me in in board shorts and thongs. <laughs> that was the best thing. I'm running it. I'm not conforming to West Perth suit and tie. Fuck it. No, no. I'm not. I love it, mate. And that will that will make you happy, wouldn't it, JD? Mate, I'm in the shorts here as well, mate. No Beautiful. shoes. Beautiful. Beautiful, We're on the same mate. page. We've just dropped the value of 1202 Hay Street uh, <laughs> today only. Right, JD. Romelius Musgrave. Uh, they've Yeah, nothing nothing too, too notable here. They've um Romelius has there's come out bee, and said there's a bee's dick in it left. They're nearly to 50%. Okay. They're bloody close. Thanks for translating. <laughs> so Romelius have come forward and said that their uh, their bid to take out Musgrave is now unconditional. So they said that their share ownership is at 47 point. 3%. Obviously, we've spoken about this in the past. The Musgrave directors have already unanimously recommended the the takeover. So it's sort of interesting to think what, what sort of changes now. Why do you still have roughly 53% of the shareholders not voting it through? And I think there's a there's a range of reasons. We've spoken about this at length on the Mincor takeover. So one potential reason could be tax benefits. There's, you know, shareholders that might have bought 11 and a bit months ago trying to hang on you got the remaining few that might be holding on for a, a better offer, which seems pretty unlikely, but highly unlikely at this point in time. I mean, others just don't know about it, haven't, you know, forgot they hold the shares. There's, there's a small percent like that. And then you've also got ETFs. There might be ETFs in particular if there are passive funds in and around that, you know, like we touched on again with the Mincor, haven't got around to accepting. So that's probably what's really holding it up. And something that Ramirez have chucked in to try and get this one over the line is their dividend. So they declared a two cent dividend per share. And the record date, I believe, is the 15th of September. So if the shareholders of Musgrave get around to accepting prior to this time, they're entitled entitled to receive that dividend. Oh, it's a juicy incentive, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> I mean, do, you, do you boys want to do a bit of finance 101 education for the money miners out there that might be from a mining background like me yeah. without notice? No guarantee that we'll have I the reckon answer. you've got it in you. <laughs> Explain why uh, and the different forms of takeovers, mergers and purchases and everything. Like, you know, how Wailu had to get 90% to get to compulsory acquisition to take out Mincor, whereas Romelius have to get 50%, some some uh, need, that, se need to take 75%. Uh, explain why this one's 50 and everything. There's a few different reasons. To, to be clear on this one, it doesn't become compulsory at 50%. Mm. Like they're, they're at 47%, you just get to a, a majority and you're controlling the company. There's a, I mean, there's a range of different reasons. One might be to do with the, the company's, you know, bylaws 
itself, but in general, the the rule for compulsory is ninety percent for ASX listed companies. And which which is seventy five is sometimes a number used, is it? I don't think that's for Australian companies. Maybe that's a vote. I think that's a that, voting it, thing. Yeah, there's different, you know, votes and like you would have seen resolutions, they might need fifty percent at yeah. a that depends AGM on the constitution. or an AGM. That depends on the company's constitution. Yeah. But I, compulsory takeovers like but by far and away need 90%. I, I think there's an episode, Maddie. you know, I, I should be more of an expert on this, but I think there's a better episode to do with a corporate lawyer. Um, who's yeah, just now we're talking lawyer. like someone else sorted yeah. out. I like it. I like it. Good work, Trav. You're starting to learn off me. <laughs> Righto, next up, JD. God, the Westerunter. The Westerunter. What a bloody region. The fabled what Western an exciting region. Wouldn't go there for a bloody holiday. I can give you a tip. <laughs> um, geez, I know. Before you get into it, now that we're a bit more confined, I feel bad if I vape because I was I was offering me lonesome in the old setup, and I could just let you go to town. But now I feel like I'd be interrupting. So I feel like the quality of our audio will improve because every time you'd vape on cue, I reckon. 30 seconds later, you would cough. <laughs> <laughs> right, hey, we're doing you a favour as well, mate. So first up with WA1, we've got a disclose I own a couple shares in this so one. Do, so do I. Yeah. So does Trav. So they had assays come out from three holes that they drilled to the eastern extent of their Lunny or Looney, were you guys saying? Oh, Looney. No, I'm Looney. It's Looney. It's definitely Looney. Definitely Looney. Looney. Yeah. Carbonatite complex. So a couple of the, the results, one of the holes that was notable from 40 metres at 17 metres at 2% niobium pentoxide. And that was, like we said, 400 metres east of the previous holes. And the other couple of holes came in at half a percent. I think one was at 29 metres. The other was um, for 54 metres, the intervals. So the, the stock hasn't really moved too much on the news. And I think that really speaks to what's coming next. Everyone in the market wants to see met results for this company. Yeah. That's that's what the fix is on. That's what people want to see. The market cap on a fully diluted basis at what they're trading at now, five bucks fifteen, is around about three hundred million dollars, which um, you know, that's I guess what the market feels is kind of right for this, given that everything sort of hinges on met. Mm. Yeah. So is that is that do you reckon that metallurgy will come out that'll probably come out by itself or will it be part of it won't be accompanied within some sort of scoping study you think the metallurgy will be sort of I think coming the, out on they're its they're already loads running some yeah. results based on yeah. some, some but the market's not gonna so. not gonna wait for yeah. a scoping study for mm. those sorts of results they've I think already still, still be a bloody far long way away to fully understand what this deposit is to get a scoping study yeah i mean happening. they've only they they pushed back the maiden resource from the quarter four of this calendar year until the first half of next year so as you can imagine a scoping study would come after that, so the the market is going to want to see much prior to that what the um, what the met looks like. Jody, was my um, was my, my impression of this announcement correct in, in sort of saying that uh, it's potentially yeah op- open further to the eastern edge now than it you know is kind of modelled in their diagrams. I mean, I think you could see that it this these results are at the eastern end of the the grid that they'd drilled out. So it's, you know, at the eastern extent what they'd planned to do. Obviously, two of the holes hadn't come in as high a grade as what the other ones had. But, yeah. you know, this one of them coming in with uh, the intersection. Yeah, at, yeah, at 2% is is a pretty encouraging result. So I'm sure in a later drill campaign, they will be planning a few holes further out that way, as well as what they'd previously touched on, which is more infield drilling going from a 200 by 200 to a 100 by 100 to get a better understanding of what they've got. So it looks like it's going to be the easiest fucking thing to mine in the world. Like everything is just <laughs> yeah. like 17 metres at 40 metres depth. Like it's yeah. just going to be uh, – you'd anticipate just free dig, just rip it up. Yeah, like, if the Met works. Yeah. If, if if the Met works. But as old Manny Dat said, uh, gr- if grade's on your side, you've got a lot of flexibility with metallurgy as well. So. It does help, yeah. Yeah, exciting stuff. Man- and- Manny does have – you know, we have to say he's got – a, a bit of like tinted glasses. He obviously wants this to go well. He's a is a shareholder, so we have to mm. sort of disclose that too. Yeah, no, we do. Yeah, God, share, true friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we get into the next one, you'll but notice before we, we get tr- into the real friends of the show, mate. Yeah, the real friends <laughs> of the show. Trav's, you'll see Trav's uh, Bloomberg laptop, here, uh, Bloomberg keyboard here. Trav's. We're, we're looking. <laughs> is it yours? Trav, oh, no, you it was Bloomberg? left here. It was left here, but I felt like it's a um, 
a nice little object for us to include. I, I we had on the bookshelf, but but Maddie's brought it right out in front of the uh, the potty here. It's a bit of a call for props. Yeah, anyone in West Perth, if you've got some toy jumbos or bloody shit that we can use, don't. Fucking give me something with your company logo just to try and flash it because <laughs> why you, well, you post that one up there with a big Bloomberg? Yeah, yeah, oh, true, <laughs> true. Any, Granted, any... Bloomberg is one of the best best businesses ever to be created. Oh, so. amazing. Yeah. Have you, was there an acquired episode on it, JD? Uh, no, there hasn't been. Should be. Yeah, there should be. be. It is a phenomenal business. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, call for props. Um, if you want your company logo, you're probably going to have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. But, like, just send us some props. We want to deck out Mining the table. Mining and finance us. stuff, yeah. Mining and finance props. We will take them at 1202 Hay Street. Absolutely. Uh, boys, capital raisings. And as a great, a great term from the people that got me here from Precision Funds Management, who's – Shaking the tin. <laughs> Who's shaking the tin? Who's I like shaking that. the tin, boys? So we've got a couple to talk about today. First up is Antipa. So they're up in the in the Pilbara looking for gold. They've got a f- couple interesting JVs, and one of the, the partnerships that they have is with Newcrest, who have decided to maintain their 9.9% ownership in the company. So they've they've gone in. So they took in $5 million bucks. They issued at 1.3 cents, and there are oppies involved, as we'll touch on with our um, – Next uh, capital raising as well. So mm, Common theme, isn't it? The old one for that's two. That's it. So one for two options exercisable at two cents. The the stock has come off there now trading again right back down to the to the issue price. So that's 1.3 cents. And to your point, Matty, it just, you know, it's a common theme because you need to incentivize these shareholders in the market we're in to come on board. And the way you do that, offer them an option. Oh, yeah. I think is it also incentivizing the – ECMs to actually do the deals because they're going to be partaking in these options to get it over the line a bit. Well, the options go to the maybe, or maybe maybe a broker fee includes options too. I, I haven't read those terms, but yeah, the options is like the the broker is only going to do the deal or get it done if they can actually if the the, the demand is actually there. And the mm. way you can guarantee the demand to be there is you you have to offer a little bit extra, which is mm. these oppies. But um, a one for two option, yeah, it's um. And it's not too far out, you know, a, a much of a premium above what the the actual. Well, price they were there is. the other week. Yeah, so it's <laughs> it's it's uh it's an attractive option. So you, you can see how that. Oh, can no, be I don't know. I'm talking about the next one. Sorry, I'm not sure yeah. where um yeah. Antipa was. But you, you, you yeah, it's it, it's a hard pill to swallow for existing shareholders when when you kind of you know are writing new paper that that fast and it doesn't. It's not like it's bringing in a huge amount of new money. And yeah, does this it is put fun- it a bit of a seal, like a potent, not a ceiling, but like. You know, when they become in the money, then you get a bit more selling pressure of people taking the dosh. Maybe, or, yeah, maybe that's that's a factor too. Which well, is more dilutive. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, dilutive. this was five million dollar raise on a company that's capped at about five, uh, at about fifty million now. So it's you know with the options as well, it's pretty pretty dilutive. Mm-hmm. And you know, on that on that theme, Black Cat was the other one. They're raising at twenty two and a half cents. We spoke about them a bit in the past. Their twenty two and a half cent price that they're raising at. Is a fifty-two week low. They were at a fifty-two yeah, week got, low before I've, they went into the mm, before they went into yeah, the. Yeah, I got the, the chart. I got the chart up here. So they were the candlestick. Mm, yeah, you love a good candlestick, don't you? I love oh, a candlestick. You got to see the gaps, JD. Okay, the gap it, in, the gapping can tell you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, trading but experts. You look at, yes, no, 52 week lows raising. And same thing as you said, so they're raising at 22.5 cents plus the attaching one for two option at 33.75 cents. Mm. And they were, they were at 26 cents before going into the, or 26.5 before going into the the trading halt pending capital raise. So, what do you yeah. guys make of the use of funds? I mean, they were pretty specific in some of the the goals of the use of funds. I haven't seen, yeah, kind of very like specific kind of use of funds like I've seen here in, in a long time. So for, for people tuning in. I think they're trying in, to just, justify why it's not going towards the restart. Right. It's going towards re, resource definition and further studies. And it, look, it did so of targeting 10% re, reduction in the pre-production capital from 42.9 to 38 million uh, based on these studies to increase met recovery and mill utilisation. But the main, uh, as it says here, it's drill, drilling to add resource to the main zone extension, which – uh, is the deepest part down yep. the bottom. So for so. for people listening on the on the audio, they're raising seven million. Four point seven was going to ongoing exploration and evaluation at, at Paulsons, and then they've got another 0.7 million going to study optimization and debt negotiation, and then the remainder one point six million for general working capital and corporate costs. Mm. So okay. uh, long and the short, they're going to need at least 
Minimum thirty-eight million coming up soon by via debt or equity or a mixture of both. So, look, it did say it did say they've received indicative term sheets from a number of debt providers currently in the process of finalising. So, I think the based on the uh, hot copper thread, I think everyone's just wanting to know: will it start? Will it restart? What's it going to cost? Is it going to restart? And imagine, so, imagine if you spoke to management, their their response would be, um, "Yeah, to, we want to do the restart sooner, but we want to be able to." raise money at a higher share price mm. so that it's less dilutive when we do have to raise that much money. Uh, exactly. By a combination of debt and equity. Guys, I'm itching to talk about the next one. Oh, <laughs> Jody, no. talk about a soft spot in your heart. A Colin. soft spot. Good friends of the show at <laughs> Sayona. I, I think we've got to be careful not to go off the rails because I'm, I'm not a fan of what we've seen here. So for those that haven't caught it, there have been some board changes. The managing director has left. That's Brett Lynch. Effective immediately. Effective immediately. We personal spoke reasons. about him. Personal reasons, yeah. For personal reasons, which we, you know, you have to respect. But we've spoken about him not too long ago in in the past, and that was with regard to 10 million shares that he'd been awarded retroactively. So that was for work done prior. And at the time, they were, you know, trading at 19 or so cents. That's $1.9 million worth of stock that he has been issued. That resolution, by the way, passed with a, 50, a glowing 53% approval from shareholders. Yeah, 50, 54.29. Hey, you got it there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> now that's a yeah, that's another bee's dick. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a t- You ever heard that before, JD? Bees I think dick? I might have. I have now in any case. So Brett Lynch still has roughly 175 million shares. And as he's no longer a director, he'll be free to sell them without, without notifying them. The company has... Over 10 billion shares on issue, so nothing will be triggered on on that sort of part. Mm, down, There's a lot of shares down, on issue, mate. They are down 25% today, JD. Ties 30, and, mate. I mean, that, Ties it up to 30 now. God, I saw it at 30 today. Oh, wow. That's, uh, why, that's why the candlesticks are good, JD. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that reaction that the market is showing toward this stock is the exact reaction that we have. I, I don't like this. A company's... Managing director resigning during ramp up is enough of a red flag. Doing it a few weeks after being paid one point nine million dollars retroactively is not a good look. And it's horrible. I mean, I'm not too sure. There's much more I can say on that one without. Well, yeah. I think it's just in terms of uh, looking at uh, investor investor confidence in in ramp up and all this happening. Yes, it is a it is a it's an you'd, investment red flag. You'd have to absolutely love the project if you're going to get comfortable investing in this. It, you just have to think it's a knockout project to get comfortable with some of the some of the other stuff that we've seen. The huge challenge is it comes at a time when shareholders still have questions that you know there's not enough color provided to them yet about. The, the big things that shareholders want to know is what price are they getting for their product? How is ramp up going? Like how long is it going to take to get to, to nameplate? I think there's there's a bit more color to come out about this operation. Keep in mind, North American lithium um, has a history of being a tricky asset. So there's just going to be big question marks um, that are going to flow through. And now they're going to flow By through tricky, in a context. tricky, you mean it put a company into into bankruptcy? There were, there were two distress situations yep. from it for, for, from prior owners. Um Heck, you know, it's like like lithium market's healthy, so you know it might make money at the um, you know at the right price and all that sort of stuff. But I just think there's there's sometimes um, real issues that come through ramp up, and we're just going to have to un- you know unfortunately like go through that experience. Shareholders are going to have to go through that experience with a new MD, and it's going to feel like that new MD might not necessarily be accountable. It's just a different. Yeah. It's a different. There was a quote that stood experience. out to me at the near the end of the announcement today. The board will take this opportunity to undertake a thorough review of operations and the strategic direction of the company to further enhance shareholder and stakeholder value. What do you reckon? We uh, hey, hit up JP Search for a bit of recruitment cost, guys. If we can get them the bloody, <laughs> then they'll keep sponsoring. <laughs> right. There we go. You, you had enough there? You, you, yeah, yeah, I think we can leave that one there. You said what you needed to say, JD? Yeah. Oh, good on you. Good on you, mate. How about we get into had Bow delete, and Coke and had, Coal? I had to delete a couple of aggressive lines that you put in. <laughs> <laughs> Bow and Coke and Coal, or as most other people pronounce it, Bowen, Coke and Coal. But you can, you, JD, you be you. You be you. So <laughs> like it's Bowen. So like an eagle. Bowen. It's Bowen. Bowen. Yeah. Bowen, it, Coke and Coal. Yeah. Oh, is that not what I'd said? No. You said Bowen. <laughs> oh, I was trying to Bowen. emphasise the Aussie accent for, for, for Bowen. you. Bowen. <laughs> Okay, but Bowen's easier for me, so that's all good. <laughs> Strong. Okay, so they've got a strategic review and an update and strategic review. Strategic review, that's and as nearly much as a red flag as 
what we'd previously discussed. You're too right, Matty. They don't, <laughs> they don't bode well. And the company's stock is down 30% today on the news. So they've got Jesus. a couple, they've got a couple high cost coke and coal operations up in, up in sunny and balmy Queensland near, up near Mackay. They've got quite a few different operations. They picked some up over the, over the past year. And there's, I mean, there's a few quotes from the announcement today that, that kind of stand out and speak for themselves. Bowen has taken steps to adjust the mine plan to maximise cash flow. After completing an internal strategic review, Bowen will concentrate on mining operations of its higher margin deposits. The project estimate has increased from 14 million to 20 million. So there's a lot of sort of chatter of that sort of nature. They're high grading. Yeah, <laughs> that's just scratching the surface. Things aren't going too well. You know, you're in a, like we said, a high cost mining area. These, these, all the operations are pretty high cost that they have. Coking coal prices and thermal coal prices have come off quite a bit. Granted, they were at phenomenally high highs last year, but it's not boning well. They've also said they've got one of their assets, the Isaac River asset. Um, they've got a sale process on it. And this one abuts the Dornier project, which has been in the news for a long time now that BHB and Mitsubishi are trying to sell along with Blackwater. I think so. And but, just that comment you made there, JD, that they said Bowen has taken steps to adjust the mine plan to maximise cash flow. So that the implications of that, like you see it all the time in underground mines and open pits are the same, it just pretty much means you're taking all the ore that is available now and you would, for an open pit case, you'd probably be stopping the pre-stripping capex. For an underground case, you'd stop developing your decline. So, look, short term you can survive, but eventually it gets to the stage. Yeah. It, it just bites you in the ass, and you've got nothing to fucking mine. Key word there, Matty, is, um, is short term, and I think this company has – more short term focus because there's balance sheet stress. Yeah. So like, but it gets to the stage if you do get the balance sheet underway, it then bites you in the ass because yeah. you've got to put so much more capital in and it's not the money that goes into it, it's time. Like you can't usually develop it quicker than you're going to develop it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so to that's where it bites, it bites companies in the ass later on when yeah. they get in this position. Agreed. On the balance sheet, Trav, they've, right, they've got $46 million in cash as of the last quarterly. They've raised mm -hmm. quite a few times over the past year. They have $133 million in fully drawn debt as well as a $40 million con note that's yeah. outstanding. I so, looked at that quarterly – JD and I think their uh, cash flow from operations in the last quarter was negative 19 million bucks and you can't continue that uh, for too long without a funding problem sort of opening up um, and correct me if I'm wrong but the finance or one of the finances of their debt facility is Taurus. Yep, that's Taurus right. won't be friendly for too long. Absolutely. So um, to our point on Sayona before Jeez, this company. Taurus have got some unfriendly debt situations don't they? <laughs> yeah it comes with the territory when you go in like they they go high yeah, up on the risk curve yeah, right. um you know that's and that's it comes with the territory that you're going to have you know some some tricky situations mm. when you do that and just just to what we touched on with say owner as well these guys have had a number of directors that have resigned in the in the last quarter alone so yeah i did say that not back in july a yeah. good look um and i saw also today data room in uh, the australian is reporting that terracom has been looking at acquiring bowen i mean given some of the stuff we read out of data room i don't know if you can hold any weight to anything that comes out of that column. <laughs> but Jesus Christ, you can hold some weight, the stuff that comes out of money and mine. Tell exactly you what right. money and mine exactly. is. You can trust us. Mm. Right, boys, Fortescue. The Ooh. good news rolls on. <laughs> another, another, and we're talking like the 10th, are we, leadership change? Yep, 10th in the, in the past roughly three years. Wow. Wow. It's not just TO, but it's executive not, not, level. Well, and this this isn't just one of your directors, uh, one of your um, base directors. This is the CEO. Fiona Hick has, uh, I'll read the words out later, but mutually agreed to leave after six months. And the current CEO of Iron Ore, Dino Otranto, has been promoted to CEO. What are you, how would you pronounce that, JD? Otranto? A Toronto, yeah. A Toronto. That yeah, okay. that's better. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Dino, yeah, so, Dino, let us know, mate. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Fiona Hick leaving after six months. I mean, yep. that, you know, this is a $60 billion company. CEOs don't leave after six months at, you know, companies like that where I think she had the, the potential with all her incentives to earn up to $7.5 million in a year. They don't leave unless they're, you know, seriously unhappy or – I mean, it, yeah, it'd be tough to get a better offer. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's there's I mean, potential, but mm. it raises it, just raises a bunch of questions. Like, yeah, and it's it's not the first. I mean, the the Chanticleer or 
Chanticleer, Maddie? Chanticleer. Chanticleer. Yeah. yeah. They um they had a summary or a headline that summarised this one best. Fortescue's revolving door is a joke. Yeah, well, that's um, – Punchy words. That's very punchy, much more to be mm. said. And I mean, the, the stock is off 5 or 6%. Granted, it's not the only piece of bad news that had come out as well. There was an impairment of US $1 billion. Mm. So that's to do with Ironbridge, right, which came in – over budget and, you know, over time as well. Yeah, I mean, they on, on Iron Bridge, the, that impairment, they referenced um, they referenced delays, cost inflation and an uplift in discount uh, rate, you know, as, as being the cause of that impairment. It does, again, pose a question about what's the NPV of this project given um, it's only recently been ramping up and that stuff will flow through over time. And plus there was $800 million OPEX guidance in relation to FFI and um, – you know, that's, that's for an entity which doesn't yet have revenue. So, again, it's just I think that what you see in that share price coming off is just um, question marks sort of being raised and, 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 and maybe it's just going to take a, a while for, um, for those questions to be answered. But, yeah, I mean, that revolving door is, is a pretty, pretty remarkable thing. I think, I think you had a stat on that one, J.D., yeah, ten execs have left in the past, you know, roughly three or so years. That's that's across, you know, the entire of F, entirety of FMG. But it just doesn't bode well. You really wonder what what goes on at an executive level there. Why the you know we really look for companies that have sustainability and you know d- durability within their management and executive team, where that intellectual property and the the knowledge that they gain is kept within the organisation, so they continue continue to perform well. And the share price has performed well. You know, operations by and large have done well over over the past few years, granted Ironbridge, which we just discussed, but it's just something that I think, you know, the market might be getting a bit fed up with at the moment. And it was interesting looking at the annual report where it said the senior leadership changes, uh, went through everything. And then the last paragraph, very brief, Fiona Hick was appointed CEO of Fortescue Metals February 2023. In August 2023, Fiona departed as CEO and that's it. Like that's like very two lines to say that your um that your CEO is leaving after six months, right at the end of the paragraph. Mm. So, yes, very interesting. And uh, I did. Uh, I don't know if this is backhanded. Ex- ex- executive chairman and founder Dr. Andrew Forrest recognised Fiona's contribution to Fortescue. We thank Fiona for her valuable efforts since joining Fortescue just under six months ago. Yeah. So really, uh, really highlighted that she was only there for six months. That's it. Not too much else to be said on that one. No, right. Gold Road. Gold. Half yearly numbers are out. Yeah, we'll, we'll flash How them on they the screen. Look? They look pretty good. Revenue, $229 million. They sold about 80,000 ounces. So this was roughly in line with the previous six months. Operating cash flow of $110 million with free cash flow of $75 million. So they got cash and equivalents of $153 million. They've also got that stake in DeGray, which is valued at a bit over four hundred. million million dollars. That's 19.99% stake in DeGray that they have. They're paying a dividend of 1.2 cents a share. So they did reiterate their guidance, although that had previously been um, pulled back a bit. So they're guiding to between 160 and 175,000 ounces at midpoint, all in sustaining cost of 600, 1,600 Aussie. So, I mean, the real, the real question I have for you guys is where do they go from here? They've got this non-operating Greer joint venture. They've got the big stake in DeGray. We've heard some sort of rumours about, you know, action at a corporate level, but wh- where do they sort of go? I mean, like you said it earlier, Trav, they're, they're like an average looking royalty company. They're the they, worst royalty company. You've got to yeah, pay costs. You have costs. <laughs> <laughs> Not but, operating joint, men- uh, yeah, joint, joint venture interest. Exactly. That's for oh. people wondering why, why you'd make the royalty analogy is because they're non-operating. You know, Goldfields operates the mine and they just have to, you know, They've got a fair few Meet more employees than a, um, a royalty company too. Yeah, mate. that, that revenue per a, employee count's not quite as good as some other companies we've mentioned big recently. Big exploration team, which is yeah. not done a lot. But it, it is interesting to see where it where it kind of goes from here. Whether they, you know, bandy together with someone, whether they try and take out Degray. I mean, that would be a, a real change in dynamic for the company because it would mean if they were to take a big swing, they would become an operator and all the challenges that. And on top of that, Degray have. You know, they haven't even developed the asset I'm, yet. So. I'm sure that if, like, whatever desires they have at, do, with Degray, I'm almost certain their long-term plan would be. Let's let's assume that they actually were successful in being able to acquire Degray or merge with, merge with Degray, right? What Gold Road would do if if their management retained management of the pro forma is they would 
joint venture it out again. They do the 50% model in, and have mm. a proven operator actually develop that asset because you need serious experience. Yeah, and that's the key difference. You'd still need to develop that asset. <coughs> yeah. I think I think in the the situa- the or the hypothesized uh, outcome that I did hear from someone a while ago and it still makes the most sense, I thought, is that <coughs> I haven't even been vaping. I'm still coughing. See, it's not the vape. Um, <laughs> the habit. gold, you know, wouldn't Goldfields just – Take out Gold Road and t- and take out De Grey. Goldfields are going to we're looking for answers. They failed the Yamana deal. Um, wouldn't it make sense for someone like Goldfields just to swoop them up and then take the interest in all of it? But who knows? Yeah, Still and I think that's I mean, a possible outcome anyway. Yeah, and I, I, th- I think historically Gold Road were public about their interest in um, in the Tropicana, the thirty percent non controlling interest there when that became for sale from IGO. Ultimately, Regis were successful in the bid for that. Um, but, you know, like it was, again, an- another one of those non-controlling joint venture interests in a really good asset, like similar to what they've got in Gruyere. So so Matt, do they still have latent interest in that asset via a potential tie-up with Regis? I think, you know, that's an- another question as well. And then maybe some some of their cash flow can fund McPhillamy's um, as well. You know, what what does that mean for for the pro forma. I, th- I think there's a bit to play out in that gold consolidation space and mm. none better than the episode with Ali to – to listen to, to, to have a taste of oh, what geez, you know, that we think that flew on YouTube. Bloody yeah. Ali G just absolutely fucking kicked it out of the park. Yeah, yeah. Mate. that's a ripper episode. Out of the park, sorry, but um, you think from what do you think from Goldfields' point of view? Like, God, now would be the way the market is. God, if you're going to take take them over, now would be a bloody good time, wouldn't it? No, like, I don't. Who I knows? don't. Unless it goes I mean, to you know, we talk more. about a tough market, but I think that's much more at the developer and explorer end of town. I don't mm. think. Gold producers are being like horrendously marked down by any by nah. any stretch. The ones in Africa are, but um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's not like it's screaming cheap or anything at the moment. Yes, right, oh boys, perfect. What do you reckon? Yeah, episode one in the bloody oh, shout out to the barn me rolls down the road. <laughs> How fucking good are they? Christmas I think I want a second one, mate, for the mm. day. Yeah, no, you've got to get in before like around 11 to get make sure the roast pork's yeah, available. Yeah, So, and look, money miners, this is our first one that we've set up here. Um, I'm, we're happy to bloody, well, I'm happy to take feedback about uh, set up improvements or stuff you'd like to see or mm. look with uh, me and JD pumped some bloody shit on the wall the other day. <laughs> look at that fucking wood and whatever Wicked they work. are. Panels. Wicked job. It's cladding. It's cladding. Uh, yeah. We'll chuck the cladding on the wall. We've got to fill in behind in the corners here. We've got to chuck some trees. But it's if there's together. any interior decorators <laughs> that want to come to 1202 and lend some expertise Pro or, just, or just bring a heap of shit with you, <laughs> feel free. We'll let you in. Yeah, Love it. in the back door. It'll get better yeah. over time, I'm sure. That's it. Mm. So, Especially yes. with our oh. partners continuing to um to fund us. Oh, the park. <laughs> now, that, <laughs> now, what that, a segue. <laughs> does that just make you bloody cringe, Joe? Look at what I've made Trav into a money-making machine. I say it as it. I got, I'm, like, I'm, I'm actually rushing you, Maddie. I'm like, hurry the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, top drill, K drill. Anytime. Anytime exploration, Terra Capital and JP Search, our great, great, True friends of the show. Thank See you. It. For Appreciate all your the support, support. guys. Hooteroo, money miners. Hooteroo. Straight from High Street. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation, and needs.